Let's have a look at 1968 as a way of preparing our discussion out of their Satanic Majesty's request and into the album uh, Beggar's Banquet. Let's sort of see what was going on um, in uh, the career uh, of the Rolling Stones. Um, in May of 1968, they released the now classic sort of Stones rock anthem, Jumpin' uh, Jack Flash, uh, goes to number one uh, in the UK, uh, number one in the US, where it's released in June in this country, May in the UK, uh, backed with a song called Child of the Moon. I'll spend a little bit more time talking about Jumpin' Jack Flash um, uh, in a song close up coming up. Uh, so let's save our discussion of it there. Uh, Child of the Moon, interesting. Uh, uh, but important thing to say about Jumpin' Jack Flash now, just to kind of keep for our reference is that Jumpin' Jack Flash is usually seen as an indication of a new direction for the Stones. And that's usually supported by um, a remark that Brian Jones made, I, you know, we've discovered a kind of a new sound for the band. And so a lot of critics have gone with that and said, ah, out with that, the Satanic Majesty stuff. Now it's Jumpin' Jack Flash, here we go. Uh, the single that follows that um, in the summer uh, of 68 in the US only is Street Fighting Man. Uh, that's backed with the song No Expectations. Again, I'm not gonna say a lot about that now because those are going to be part of a song close-up uh, that's coming up. But just to get a sense of, you know, June of 68, we've got Jumpin' Jack Flash. August of 68, we've got Street Fighting Man in the United States. Um, it turns out that as a single, Street Fighting Man is not released in the UK until the summer of 1971. <laughs> so and somebody just got around, hey, did we ever release that as a single? No, I don't think we did. Well, let's release it. And what they put on the back of it is a song called Surprise, Surprise, which goes back even farther. We'll talk about that when we get to the discussion of Street Fighting Man. Finally, Beggar's Banquet uh, released in December of 1968, a full year after their Satanic Majesty's request, uh, going to number five in the US, number three in the UK. Um, it's an indication of how much things have changed for the Rolling Stones, that there are no tours in all of 1968. There's just one live show. They appear at the New Musical Express award show. New Musical Express, like Melody Maker, Sounds. These were all music magazines uh, in the UK, and they would have award shows, and bands would perform. The Beatles did tons of these Rolling Stones, too. So they do show up in May of 68 to play live, but there's there's, uh, there's no tours, no live gigs. Uh, Brian, uh, unfortunately, uh, is busted for drugs in May uh, of 1968. Um, that's probably not a good thing, considering his mental uh, state. And in fact, uh, he continues to remain active on Beggar's Banquet, but it's not gonna be long before um, there's not much of the old Brian Jones left. This is kinda his last hurrah. So that gives us a picture of what's going on in 68. Actually, you know, a couple of singles, an album that comes out, one live gig. Um, not a tremendous amount of activity. But you might say, well, are the Stones slowing down? Well, everybody's slowing down at this point. As we've made the transition from singles being the dominant thing, which is the way it was during the 63 through 66, 67 period, you needed to have three singles out a year so that you know every three or four months there was a new single and hopefully you would you would get a full lifespan out of each single by the time your new one came out your other one had gotten all the chart action it could possibly get and you'd start with a new one and that's the way you do it so you had to be bringing this material out every three or four months and you bring out albums as kind of extra things people could buy if they really like the singles well when this when the emphasis changes away from singles to the albums themselves usually Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is the album that really kind of firmly establishes this album-oriented rock kind of idea, then it's the albums that are the important thing, and they take longer to, to produce. And so we see this with all groups, that you know if you can get an album a year at this point, uh, you're doing pretty good. So at this point, the Satanic Majesty's uh, request, that's December 67, Beggar's Banquet, uh, that's December 68. The Stones are really pretty much on track here. They haven't really slowed down. They've just changed their emphasis from the singles uh, to the albums themselves. And because of the artist mentality, they just can't crank out cover versions anymore. Each song has to kind of do something important or novel or interesting. They can't just do the same thing uh, over and over again. So the, it's a little bit harder to crank out a full album's worth of that kind of uh, material. So it's, it's not just that way for them. As I say, it's that way for everybody. It's a sign of the times. It's the way the business is. Let's just take a minute to talk a little bit about video and television uh, with regard to the Rolling Stones. Because we haven't said too much about it. We have, I've dropped some remarks uh, here and there as we've gone by. But let's sort of pull all that together. 
And during this period, 1968, they start to have numerous videos directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg, uh, including 2000 Light Years from Home, Jumpin' Jack Flash, and Child of the Moon. Um, Michael Lindsay Hogg is interesting uh, because he ends up um, directing Rock and Roll Circus, the Stones' um, uh, television show. Uh, it was a television broadcast that was supposed to be broadcast in December of 1968 but that Mick decided he didn't like the way it ended up looking and working out, so he sort of put the kibosh on the broadcast and it was never broadcast. You can see it now on DVD or YouTube or wherever it is that you find video. But at the time, it was recorded, uh, produced, and, and, and not done. Um, the Rock and Roll Circus uh, included the Rolling Stone, performances by the Rolling Stones, including a fantastic uh, performance of Sympathy for the Devil. Um, with J John Lennon is on, that, uh, is on that show with Yoko Ono, The Who. Um, a quick one while he's away, I think, is what they do. Uh, Jethro Tull um, does, a, does a couple of numbers with Tony Iommi, who would later be in Black Sabbath, filling in on guitar because Mick Abrahams had just left the group and Martin Barr had not yet joined the group, so Tony Iommi sort of like did that gig um, as a favor to Ian Anderson. Uh, and there are other, others on that, uh, that show as well. Uh, it was meant to promote The Beggar's Banquet, but the show was never aired. Uh, various explanations have been offered. Um, some people say Mick didn't like it because he thought The Who uh, blew the stones off the stage. Uh, I, I've watched the video. I don't think that's the case. The Who are fine. <laughs> Great performance, thank you very much. But I think the Stones are awesome uh, on that, and I think Sympathy for the Devil is absolutely a classic. If you haven't heard, seen them perform Sympathy for the Devil on the Rock and Roll Circus, it's a must-see if you're a, a Stones fan. Uh, but Michael Lindsay Hogg, interesting because he goes on to, uh, to uh, direct Let It Be, that ill-fated Beatles uh, uh, movie where instead of being the chronicle of a band making an album, it was a chronicle of a band uh, breaking up. Uh, and so Lindsay Hogg had, had done um, uh, television, BBC sort of pop music television, so it was already kind of knew these guys and became sort of one of the go-to guys in this period, 68, 69, as the kind of a television guy. The, the Rolling Stones had videos produced by other people. We mentioned before Peter Whitehead, um, and he's, he's an interesting uh, uh, fellow. Uh, he had uh, 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 done, he did the video for Have You Seen Your Mother, Baby, which, remember, was important to us because it had images of the Stones dressed as women, and that I, I argued, had a real impact on how one would view the meaning of the lyrics there. Uh, he also did videos for Lady Jane, Let's Spend the Night Together, We Love You, Dandelion, um, Ruby Tuesday, and he also did a video of The Pink Floyd doing their classic psychedelic track, Interstellar Overdrive. So this is a guy who was really part of that London scene at the end of the 1960s, Peter Whitehead. So this video component uh, becomes increasingly important uh, because it helps us see how the, view, how the um, artist ideally wants to be viewed and how the images mix with the images in the lyrics and the image of the band as they appear um, uh, uh, in their own promotion. So it becomes increasingly important for us. So we're going to keep an eye on that uh, as we go forward. I'll be talking about it some more uh, both this week and in, in the weeks that follow. Uh, well, let's move on to our discussion of the second big album for this week's lectures, Beggar's Banquet.